All right. Well, thank you so much, Kelly, for that great introduction. And thank you especially for having us here, especially having us here two weeks in a row. <laughs> Um, so we are here for our second round of environmental selling storytelling with uh, virtual field trips. And I have a couple of new faces with us this week. So we have uh, Jeffrey Bruce and we have Tom Ruberto. And let me do a quick screen share. That's not what I meant to do at all. Hold please. It's the wrong share button. Yes, there we go. And I'm going to be looking for thumbs up from people that they are seeing the correct presentation screen. Outstanding. Thank you so much. As we all know, moving into this digital virtual world, <clears throat> you know, presentations are never as smooth as you want them to be. Anyway, welcome back for day two of creating virtual tours for environmental storytelling. Um, and so, what I want to do real quick is introduce you to Jeff Bruce and Tom Roberto. So Jeff, why don't you give everyone a quick shout out. Hello, who are you? What do you do? Uh, hey everybody, um, Jeffrey Bruce. I'm the manager of immersive technologies at uh, Arizona State University's uh, ETX Center. And um, I um, build, create, uh, evangelize, <laughs> um, promote virtual field trips. I've been doing it for 25 years building these through NASA and ASU and, and all over the place. So um, happy to be here. I'm happy that we have uh, Jess and Cena at the helm, fantastic ambassadors to this and uh, happy to be part Bless of it. you. And I'm just gonna say that Jeff is incredibly humble. Um, he, is, he is the God of virtual field trips and virtual tours. He is the sole reason that we have this incredible tour builder that is coming at you, so. Uh, kudos to Jeff. We wouldn't be here without him. So um, on to you, Tom. Now that we've introduced God, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little less. Uh, my name is Tom Roberto. I'm a PhD candidate uh, studying geology and geoscience education. Uh, my research involves uh, building, designing uh, virtual field trips, uh, and then testing their efficacy as a learning modality. Um, so that's what I do and uh, look forward to working with you today. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Um, and then if you were with us last week, you also met two of our teachers within the network. You met John Dupuy, who is a high school educator um, out of Lafayette, Louisiana. And you also met Sarah Bowman, who's a middle school educator based out of LA, um, California. Um, and what we covered last week, whoops. What we covered last week was we did a quick introduction over what is this Infiniscope thing? Where did it come from and what, what do we produce? We talked a little bit about these uh, virtual field trips or virtual tours. Uh, we kind of did a quick overview of the types of virtual field trips and virtual tours that we create <clears throat> and really drew that distinction between uh, what is considered a tour and then what is considered an adaptive field trip. Um, and that ultimately our goal is right now, we're gonna help you build tours, but then looking into the future, you'll be able to take those tours and embed them into an adaptive platform so that you can turn them into gated and instructionally relevant tours to use with your students moving forward. And then finally, you also got to talk with our two teachers, as I said, and so they gave you stories from the trenches of creating their own virtual tours with us last year um, what they found to be beneficial with creating these tours um, and what they look forward to in the future, knowing what's coming down track with the uh, virtual tour builder that Jeffrey has been working on. So our plan for today over the next uh, hour-ish together, um, we're gonna talk just a little bit about, give you kind of a preview about the process of building one of these virtual tours. So how do we facilitate um, virtual tour building with our educators? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the tools that we use for creating virtual tours, and that's where Jeffrey and Tom specifically are going to come in. And Tom's also going to give you a little bit of flavor about uh, place-based education, why it's important, and a little bit about his research, um, in addition to showing you some of the 360 cameras that you can utilize on your cell phones that you can utilize. <clears throat> and then finally, we'll also cover how you guys can get involved in creating your own virtual tours. 
Okay, so with that overview, let's go ahead and get started. So let's talk a little bit about the process of creating this, this virtual tour. Um, so we, last summer, as, as we spoke last, last week, we talked a little bit about the professional development that we had put together with teachers um, and shared a little bit about that particular process. Um, Jeffrey actually is in the midst of, and, and Tom too, they're both in the midst of putting together a new form of professional development with a group of educators out of Hawaii using this virtual tour builder. So not the, not the Google um, Poly tour builder, but actually our tour builder <clears throat> and working with them on how to create virtual tours. And so what we're doing is we're learning from the way that they're deploying this this training and then we will be applying that the lessons learned from their training into our training this coming summer so it's an evolution um so last year when we when we did ours what we really focused on we wanted to talk a lot about what is this place-based education and why is place so important so as i mentioned tom's going to talk a little bit about that here shortly um, then we talked about storytelling. What is storytelling and how do you utilize digital tools to tell a story and draw people into <clears throat> the story that you're trying to tell? Then we talked about storyboarding. So how do you put together um, all of these, these, this digital media in order to facilitate the story that you wanna tell? And also talked a little bit about Creative Commons licensing. So the difference between citation and acknowledgement of the media that you're already using that's out there on the internet. We talked about digital tools for assessment. So in addition to using the, the virtual tour builder, what other tools can you use from around the, the, the digital world that we were really thrust into specifically last year? Um, but what kind of digital tools could you use for assessment of these types of things? And then finally, we did a virtual tour showcase where we brought all of our educators together and they did a show and tell of the tours that they created. And we brought a whole host of people in. We brought them from all over our ASU ecosystem. We invited people from our network. It was, it was uh, a good time to be able to kind of see how people built their tours. So that's kind of a baseline. And then we're gonna modify for this coming year. Um, so what I wanna do right now is to give you just kind of a taste, a teaser of a couple of these elements. So you can kind of get a sense of, of where we're going and what we plan to do over this next year. So what I wanna do is introduce you to Retha Hill. Um, Retha Hill um, is um, here at Arizona State University and she's got a fantastic video for us. She recorded a video for us so that we could utilize in these sort of um, uh, webinars. Uh, talking about um, the importance of place and using place as a character. So I'm gonna actually turn it over to her via video. I should be sharing sound. Hi, I'm Rita Hill. I've been a journalist for most of my life, although the tools I use now in my own work at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism are less likely to be a pen and a reporter's notebook and more likely to be VR or AR goggles. I spent the bulk of my career at the Washington Post as a reporter before launching the website in 1996. Then I became vice president for BET Interactive, where I launched that website. In 2007, I came to ASU to start the New Media Innovation and Entrepreneurship Lab. And one of the things I really enjoy is working with boundary pushing, innovative students and colleagues at various departments around ASU, including here at the Center for Education Through Exploration. I was asked today to talk to you about the importance of place in storytelling. As a journalist, one of the first lessons you learn when it comes to writing is the importance of the five W's and the one H, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. We use it to tell pretty simple stories. It's a formula, but it helps us to remember never leave the scene of a story without answering those vital questions. That formula helps us uh, with simple stories and complex stories. A simple story like reporting on a man who was killed while in an intersection, for example. We tell the who, that he was a 45-year-old man, what was killed, when, Tuesday night, where, at the Main and Elm intersection near the courthouse, why, when he ran into the street, and how he was struck by a delivery truck. 
we know we have to each all of those to answer each of uh, answer each of those questions or they'll be heck to pay by a grumpy old editor back at the city desk. As the story goes on, we fill in the details. We tell a little bit more about the who, the man's name, where he worked, if he was married or a father. The what might add more of the particulars and the why and the how are the crux, answering for all of his neighbors the burning question of how it came to pass that a 45-year-old man was killed. 45-year-old men are not supposed to die, at least not that way. The where, the place, the room where it happens, at, as Hamilton and John Bolton has reminded us in recent days, it usually doesn't take center stage until it's in the hands of more skilled writers, or sometimes in the hands of hacks, who take six, seven paragraphs to set up a scene. However, the where, the place, in a documentary and especially a 360 video such as a virtual field trip is probably the most important thing. At least it's in, as is important as the what. Place, you see, should never be something that you rush through on your way to the who, the when, or even the why and the how. In 360 video and virtual field trips, the where is almost everything you have to draw the watcher in to get her to pay attention and to listen to all that comes along with it. To explore this a little bit more, I wanted to talk about a master storyteller who elevated the where to an exalted position next to the what, Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain, that late great troubled chef and wanderer was a genius when it came to this for his show CNN, Parts Unknown. Notice he tells you in the title of the show what he's doing, focusing in on the parts, the places, on the places that perhaps we thought we knew but didn't, or the places that we chose not to know because of our own misconceptions. What Borton did was to treat the place as the central character of his 60-minute documentaries. And I bet you thought the food was the star. Of course it was, but it was the place that begat the people who made the food that made us want to come along with Anthony each season. His documentary on the Mississippi Delta is a case in point. Bourdain usually came up with a theme around a place. Um, he tried to come up with a question that he wanted to answer. In Mississippi, what I heard and saw in that show was the push-pull of the Delta's horrifying past of racial intolerance and brutality, but also the thick ties of the people to each other and to the state that made Mississippi a place like no other in the United States or even in the world. Anthony talked about the ghost of Mississippi's past, a past so terrible that made, it made him wonder why of all the places in the world that he traveled to, including Iran and Saudi Arabia and South Africa, he asked, why can't I love Mississippi? And that's what he set out to do, to see if he could try. And that's how he framed the piece. So he took us on a canoe ride with one of his guests in the early morning mist on the Mississippi to catch the fish that would later, later become a breakfast for a bunch of African-American city kids so they could taste what sustained their forefathers. And that's why he took us to Oxford, Mississippi, where younger white foodies who looked like they'd be more at home in Portland than in Mississippi had come back there to challenge the notion of what people thought about Mississippi and what they thought about the food. And that's why he most famously took us to Poe Monkey's Juke Joint. The image of a shack in the woods where people were liquored up and folks like Bad Bad Leroy Brown would cut you as soon as look at you is what people typically think of when you think of a, a juke joint. So at Poe Monkey's, Bourdain's camera squeezed into the tight spaces of that juke joint. It was nestled in the back of a cornfield but it was one of the few remaining spots on the old blues trail, the blues trail that birthed rock and roll and R&B. Family night at Poe Monkeys, Bourdain told us, is mostly locals, a mixed bag. The music is R&B and pre-disco soul, the attitude loose. 
just familiarize yourself with those rules and there won't be any problem. Oh man, that line and looking at the people gathered there, heads bobbing to some old blues band, hand dancing, that place, it made me someone who's always fiercely feared Mississippi want to go there and get a little bit of that place. Anthony talked about in that place the complexity, the contradiction, and the unexpectedness that lurk around every corner in Mississippi. That was masterful. It was a master storyteller making you challenge your assumptions about a place that perhaps you thought you knew. So you might ask yourself, I'm no Anthony Bourdain, or my students aren't, what can students do? A lot. Back in uh, 2019, Thomas Roberto, one of the PhD students here in this program, and I did a, a project on the community of Garfield. Garfield is located just north of the ASU downtown campus. In about 10 days, 20 or so high school students created a window onto Garfield that the locals are still talking about. We created a podcast, an animated motion book, a video game about the change based on all that was happening, but also guided the complexity of what was going on. And we also created a high res virtual reality field trip that captured the change that was engulfing the community right then and there. But like Bourdain, we didn't just jump into it. We set out to know the place. We walked the streets, talked to the longtime residents and the recently arrived. We met the quirky people who lived there and talked to the trendy. We admired the various housing styles from the old four squares to the bungalows to the modern alt dwellings. Those buildings marked in brick and stone and wood and stucco the city's evolution from a dusty old Western town to the nation's fifth largest city. Garfield, you see, was Phoenix's first suburb. It got that way because enterprising residents themselves put in an extension to the city streetcar line so people wouldn't be afraid or reluctant to buy a plot of land so far out of town. That was in the 1880s and it worked. The fashionable and the well-connected moved to Garfield, which was located, of course, just outside the city line. That theme the theme that emerged for us was Garfield's historic willingness to make its own destiny. And today, newbies moving into the relatively affordable, beautiful historic homes or renovating reclaimed commercial buildings find out pretty quickly that if you understand that simple rule in that history, there won't be any problems. For students who might be doing a virtual field trip on their own neighborhoods, here are a few tips. Just respect the place. Do your research on the neighborhood's origins. Seek out the old timers who can tell you how things like really happen, who can tell you about those little gems that might take you years otherwise to discover on your own. Talk to the historical society and the leaders at various churches and temples and recreation centers to find out how it really happened. Go out and soak it all in and then tell it not how you thought it was, but simply how it came to be. Look at it with your own fresh eyes. And most of all, just honor the place for what it is, for all its beauty and all its warts. Just honor it, tell the truth. And if you do that one simple thing, there won't be any problems. Thank you for listening to me and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions in the live session. Thank you. Now, obviously, and unfortunately, Aretha is not here with us today, but um, I, I do want to just kind of reiterate that, I mean, even though she's talking about specifically um, neighborhoods, you can just sub out the word neighborhood for environmental story or ecological story, and everything she says still fits. You should immerse yourself into the environment that, that you're trying to tell the story about. What is it specifically that you're wanting to share with your students? And so that's one of the things that we'll work with you on um, during our professional development coming this summer 
is how can we how can we dig into those stories? How do we connect with people and gain interviews from them and understand it from their perspective? Um, you know, just to continue to um, so that we can interpret it and in, through our own eyes for our students and help them better understand the environment in which they live. Um, so let me close this. Oh oh oh! Come on. What what what? Nope. Hi, I'm Rita Hill. Oh, we're gonna watch it. I've been a journalist for most of my life. Sorry, my screens are hidden and I cannot get this thing to shrink. Let's do this. Maybe. There we go. Okay. Um, so once we've established something Hi. regarding storytelling. Um, last year we talked about storyboarding. So how do you structure that story? How, what kind of sequence do you put it in? What little side, um, little side locations do you want to point out or take your students on in this adventure? You know, do you want it to be a choose your own adventure sort of style? Do you want them to be able to kind of go out and back? Um, do you want it to be kind of a circular motion? So what you'll see down here is there are a variety of what we call, <coughs> excuse me, what we call flow maps. So um, last, what, last year, what we talked about is storyboarding has now morphed into this concept of creating these, these flow maps. So thinking in terms of, you know, what is, the, what is that, that 360 degree image? What is that place? And where do you want to put images? And where do you want to put sound clips and movie clips? And where do you want to put web pages? And do they link to another 360 degree view? And so thinking through how that storytelling may look, you know, maybe I go forward and then all the way back, or I can just only go forward. Um, so we have a variety of ideas on these different types of flow maps that you can apply with your students or even with your, with your own storytelling. And then finally, another little piece that I wanna share with you is Creative Commons licensing. Um, this one has been really huge. <laughs> this, this one is, has become a, a major emphasis for us as we get into building these virtual tours, because as you can expect, there's a lot of media that gets, gets integrated, whether it's your own media or usually things that are already pulled from the internet. So helping our students and ourselves better understand how to cite and how to acknowledge, which are two very different things, um, those are important skills. <laughs> and so we work with um, sharing Creative Commons licensing with our educators, but also in the um, PBL unit that we're testing right now with middle school students, we have an entire section just helping them understand the difference between citation and um, Creative Commons licensing. So let me give you a quick taste here of Creative Commons licensing. This is just a uh, three or four minutes just to kind of get a sense of well, what is this thing if you're not familiar with it. Let's kind of get you familiar with it and then you'll understand what we'll dig into a little bit more later. When we go on the internet, it's common to scroll through other people's images, videos, writing, and artwork. We might even want to use them for projects in school or at home. And we might think, I found it online, so it's mine. But that's not the case. We can't treat things we find online like a free-for-all. The good news is that there are legitimate ways to use material we find online. But first, we need to be aware of three concepts. Copyright, public domain, and fair use. Why is all of this so important? For one, there are legal reasons for protecting everyone's creative work. And there are also ethical reasons to give credit to the people who create the things we see and find online. Let's start with the legal reasons why we should think twice before copying and using someone's work. The first is copyright. Copyright is a legal protection that creators have over the things they create. Copyright requires people to get permission before they copy, paste, alter, or share what someone else has made. Most things that we find, download, and copy and paste from the internet are copyrighted. This means that the people who created them own the content and have a say in how they're used. But that doesn't mean that everything on the internet can't be used. Some creators indicate that their content is okay to be used by others, and other content might fall under what's called public domain. Let's look at what public domain means. 
When we search for content that's in the public domain, it means these creative works are not copyrighted and are free to use without permission by anyone, however they want. According to U.S. law, some content becomes available as public domain after a certain number of years have passed since its creation. There are also specific images and documents published by the government that are considered public domain. So, when in doubt, search public domain to find a ton of things that are totally free to use. Now, if we want to use a photo, a video, music, or other content that's copyrighted, there are still a few things we can do. We can simply reach out and ask the creator for permission. Many creators are happy to give permission to reproduce their work, as long as they're given credit. The third concept to take advantage of is called fair use. Fair use allows us to use copyrighted work without permission, but only in certain ways and in specific situations. These conditions involve four areas to consider. Amount, purpose, nature, and effect. First, we can only use a small amount of the original work. This means someone can't copy the whole copyrighted song in their dance video, but they can use a short clip of it. Second, there has to be a new purpose in the project, meaning that we transform the original work into something new and different. Next, it's easier to claim fair use if the nature of the original work is non-fiction or based in fact, rather than creative or fictional. And finally, we need to ask ourselves whether the effect of the new work negatively affects the creator or the value of the original content. For instance, are we charging for or making money off someone else's work? Claiming fair use is determined on a case-by-case -case basis, but it's more likely acceptable if it's 1. for schoolwork and education, 2. for criticizing or commenting on something, 3. for news reporting, or 4. for comedy or as a parody of something. We can think of fair use kind of like a square, and ask ourselves, is it fair and square? So that's the legal stuff. But let's not forget the ethical considerations when using content found online. Think about it, if you created something original and put it online, wouldn't you want others to give you credit for your work? What if they changed it or made money off it and no one knew you were the original creator? That's just not right. So remember, when we go online in search of things to use, keep these three concepts in mind. Copyright, public domain, and fair use. We're all creative thinkers and creators, and it's always important to give credit where credit is due. And now you will all watch me struggle again to try to get away from this video. Ready? No, oh, we're playing again. <laughs> Yay. Okay. So that's just a little about Creative Commons licensing. Um, we dig just a little bit deeper in it in, in our um, summer uh, training. So, um, so that's just a, a, little, a little taste of all of the things that um, will be coming at you and learning how to create these virtual tours, all things that are skills that are easily transferable to your students. Um, but honestly, that's really enough talking from me. I think what you guys really need to hear is from Jeffrey um, because he's going to give you guys a tour, a demo of the actual tour builder. Um, Jeff, you want me to run your slides for you? That would be fantastic. You want me to just say next slide? Would that be easy? That works beautifully. Perfect. All right. Next Take slide. it away, Jeff. <laughs> uh, next slide. Um, so <laughs> uh, I don't have all this fun, fancy music with animations. Um, uh, that even some of the, the videos we just saw. So I hope you will bear with my um, my voice and my very static slides. But we will get to a cool demo, which will be fun and interactive. Uh, but I just wanted to go over um, just just a couple things really quick. I mean, there are a lot of a lot of components to building a virtual tour. Um, and but there's one that Jess really wanted me to talk about today, which is how to choose your location, um, kind of how to choose the where. So, you know, the cool thing about um, the where in virtual field trips and virtual tours is that they give you the opportunity to use this immersive media to combine three key elements. And those three combined elements can be a powerful form of communication. You have location, a sense of place, and as, a, as Rita said, kind of a character. You have the story, interesting narrative, and you've got content, this compelling media. And all three of those together can really be powerful. And I think that's what is really exciting about this type of media. So next slide. 
So there's some insight into why or how we have chosen the where. So, you know, in other words, how do I choose where to capture the tours that I've, I've been creating over the last number of years? So what do I personally look for in a place? And, and, and you know, when the location is a character, as we heard from Rita, then we are looking for unique features on that character. And that means both the place um, that you see and find, but also in capturing the place. And so with 360 spiracles, they make for a really good uses for that basis as it evolves that character via the technology, the location, and the story. So let me show you a couple examples of what I mean like that, um, of what we've done over the years. So next slide. So in looking at this, these are all 360s. Okay, I flatten them out. You'll, you, you have, I'm sure you will learn about the equitangular image, which is a 360 flattened image. These are all what I'm gonna show you, these equitangular that are flattened out. So this is a 360 image. This is a, uh, you know, in looking at it, it's a mountainous area with this road going through it. There's a little, you know, maybe old Roman area back there. You know, we, what's really compelling about that? And so at a, at a high vantage point like this, it might not be that interesting, but if you next go to a more close up view, what this is, is this is one of the most studied uh, geographic and geologic sites uh, on the planet as it relates to the 66 million year old extinction of the dinosaurs. So where I highlighted that little yellow line, um, that's where geologists from all over the world go to really explore this one area that um, gave evidence to the asteroid that uh, played a huge role in, in eliminating the dinosaurs. But what's really fascinating about this is when you look at it as a picture, really you can't tell the full scope of, of what's interesting about this site unless you're looking at a 360, because as you can see, there's a road right behind it. <laughs> there's nothing fancy about the site when you're driving by it, you may not even notice it. Um, and so it's, it's really fascinating when you look in 360, how to take what really appears in some uh, works on paper to be super significant and, and, and very uh, interesting to being somewhat uninteresting for users when they pass by. And it's just an interesting example of, of what, 360's, what, three, what a 360 image would do to that. So next slide. So something like, for instance, here, this is uh, Croatia, that's the island of Var. And if you look down in the right corner of the island, you really want to be able to understand you know, what's so significant about this particular location. Well, if we jump to the next slide, and I'll do it a detailed shot into that. Geologically speaking, this is where it's one of the only evidence that we see on the planet where we see um, remains from the 66 million year old asteroid impact that caused a 100 meter, 300 foot tsunami that raced across um, all the oceans. And it just so happened to run into this landmass, and we see evidence of that here. So by getting up close, now you can actually look at it. If you're jealous, you can study the different rock formations. And so it's kind of cool. That area now comes to life a little bit better um, when we're looking at that. So other things when capturing a location, not only what makes the site important, but being able to show the most interesting parts, whether close or at scale. And there's two different examples of that. So next slide. So for example, here, this kind of, uh, this is actually in Chivalosto, Argentina, just kind of looks like an arid kind of deserty area, somewhat like the Badlands. But in this case, I'm gonna say next slide, what we do is we highlight the details. Now, this is where I talked about the dinosaurs, you know, when they go extinct. Well, this is a site that actually highlights the first times we start to see dinosaurs in the evolutionary record, which is really cool. So by keeping that up close, the students were, depending on where you put the camera, the spherical, they actually feel like they're there. They can look, they can see those fossils up close and you have the ability to just label those. So now it becomes super interesting because now you have identified a little bit more about what looked maybe some rocks. And when they, they zoom in a little closer, they can see, oh, these are fossils, this was a femur. And then you can have the sense of story that, well, this is one of the first dinosaurs that ever existed, which is kind of cool. But up close, sometimes things don't look good up close. So for example, next slide. Um, here is, and some of you with the Game of Thrones fans, um, this is taken from uh, Zumaya, which is where they shot Game of Thrones, one of the components. And this is also the 66 million year old boundary, but up close, it's not as interesting because you don't really get a sense of um, kind of place or scope that the character, if you want, doesn't really shout out what that boundary is. So if, depending on how you wanna shoot this content, so for example, next slide, looking at it from a, different perspective. Now what we can see is where that little inlet is, 
and just to the left, that's where that 60 million year old boundary is. But the cool part about this is that you can't, it's very difficult to see, but all the little iterations of rocks that go to the left and right are every 10,000 years. So now geologically speaking and educationally speaking, this has a little more interesting part of its character. It's got a history to it. You see to the left are millions of years into the past. To the right are millions of years into the future. And so next slide, you can actually highlight that with simply adding a little bit of text to it. So now you've gone from an image that can tell a little bit of a story or allow them to allow a student to understand a little bit through a dialogue to actually explaining it with some sort of overlay. Um, so what I wanted to do is just pretty much give you a, a, a brief uh, insight into when we look for locations, we look for a scientifically significant, unique, um, uh, did we skip that slide? Maybe I skipped that slide, it was in there. Um, yep, it's all right, no, it's good. We don't have to go all the way back, it's good. <laughs> so, you know, what, what really is fascinating to me is, um, you know, uniqueness, um, interesting, scientifically significant uh, locations and something that really tells a story. And so as Rita, Sell, as Rita said, this is where the, the location becomes a character. It becomes something that can be talked about, described, highlighted, and you can add different elements of that. So um, as I said, there's so many different components of virtual tours um, and virtual field trips and just wanted me to highlight that aspect of location and place before I jumped into giving you guys a demo. Uh, so um, I'm shared, correct? Yep, okay, good. Uh, so what I want to let you know, I'm going to give you a tour. I'm going to build a virtual tour for you guys. I'm gonna to try to make it quick. I try not to go fast on the screen because I know we have bandwidth issues. But I want to let you know that what I'm doing is I'm placing media in the tool. So you can see how the tool works. As Jess talked about, there's so many other elements of storytelling and you know, how to bring that site to life. Um, what I'm doing is I'm just showing the technology part. I'm not going into the story component of it. Clearly that's a, a lot more than we have time to do in, in this particular demo. So um, I will share my screen right now. And the first thing I'm going to share, this is a, I'm gonna look over at the screen, so don't think I'm not looking at you all. Um, it's on a different screen. This is it's considered a flow map. And as Jess alluded to, we go from story telling to flow map, but I wanna let you know, this is how I'm going to build the tour in front of you today by using something that you all will become familiar with or already have. Um, and I'm going to use that uh, as I put these together. So this is the tool that we came up with, the virtual tour builder right now, for a lack of a better name. Uh, we might actually name it better soon, but uh, uh, we tried to make it as simple and easy to use as possible, kind of in the democratization of allowing others um, to create this in a somewhat free fashion. And we tried to make it so again, it was super simple and super informative, uh, intuitive. So when you come to this tool, you won't have these other projects, you would just have a button. And I'm, I'm going to just make it very clear. You click a new project and we will just call this, we'll just make it called Grand Canyon. And then what I'm going to do now, there's a couple ways to upload a panorama. Um, the technology of a 360 image that I just showed you is what I'm going to load into here. Um, I'm going to drag and drop one and it will show up. as it's queued up and we're going to label that. So I'm going to put my labels on it. Let's just label that the granaries. And then I'm going to add another one. Uh, in this case, I'll add one right here. And again, I just got off screen. I've just got a folder of a file that I'm just going to drag and drop that in and I will type this, the confluence. And for the sake of fun, I'm going to add one more um, just because Jess did point out the flow map and navigation. So I'll just show you a way that we can hop to one, hop to another one and hop all the way back. And this one we're gonna call the narrows and there we go, the notes. Now, interestingly enough, they are all here in our panoramas file in our project. And a simple thing that we've made is all you do is click on 
the panorama and it opens up. And now we are in a 360 degree environment simply from, it does all the compiling on the back end for you and we're ready to go. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add in the panorama properties, I'm going to add just a title or a, a little explanation that you'll see where it pops up. Here's a little description. I'm a super fast typer, as you can tell. And there we go. And I click save the changes. Now you're going to see some of these go in and you'll see where they appear when we, um, when we preview the panorama. But the first thing we want to do is let's add a picked. So I'm going to come right up here to the granaries and I'm simply going to double click. Ah, and that brings up a properties window and we can select the type of hotspot we want to add. So I'm going to add an image right here. And that image, I'm going to title it. Let's title it Granary Bins. And we're just going to give a little text on those bins and put it right here. And then we're going to upload a pic. And I'm just going to drop that picture right there. Now, I will say that the panos and the pics and the PDFs all have a 10 megabyte limit right now. Um, we did that for bandwidth issues and whatnot, and we're exploring, we wanna go a little bit more, a little less on that, but just know that when you're putting your files together, if they're not uploading, check the file size. So we're going to hit accept, and there it is. So it's in there. Now what we're gonna do is we'll add a couple more images, just so we can go the process again. One we'll put down here, and we'll put this as a, image as well. And we're just going to call this one boats on the river. And we'll call that what it's like, what, it, what is like on the river. And we'll just drag this little boat picture in here. Very simple. And up it goes. Now, one other way to add a hotspot is you can come here to this little tool right here and you click here and it will add a hotspot and you can move that hotspot around. So I'm going to put one right here. I'm going to change it to an image. And we're going to call this one. This is where a little humor comes in, maybe necessities. And we're going to call this one the loop. And we'll put that one right down here. It's going to be important. I'm not just putting in there for a reason. There's important, not for travel reasons, but you'll see what I do when I input um, another piece of technology. So now we have three picks in our, in our panorama, and we want to add a video. So the types of video that we add, we'll put uh, one right here and we will make this a YouTube video. You can use YouTube or Vimeo. Uh, we stream those in. We're just gonna make a title. We're gonna call this Dr. Simpkin. And we're just gonna call it an overview of the Grand Canyon. And I'm going to take a regular HTTP YouTube link and paste it in right there. That's all we need to do and we're good to go. So the last thing I'm going to put on this particular um, panorama is I'm just going to show you that we can click here and add a PDF. So I'm going to take a PDF and we're just going to call it river guide notes and I'm going to upload our PDF. Drag and drop that in there. Uh, again, um, 10 megabyte limit. And there we go. While I'm saying that, we do have features up here that you can delete the hotspot, you can revert it in case you made changes, and you can accept it. Um, and it does have an auto save, which is kind of nice. I just thought I'd point that out. Now what we want to do is we want to jump to the next panorama. We have to be able to get there. So we double click again for a hotspot. And in this case, we're going to use the panorama hotspot. Now we want to have a title for that. So we're going to go to the confluence first. And what we do is we select our drop down to the confluence, which is already loaded. We already have that as one of our panos. And there it goes. And we're good to go. Now, how do we edit that? We can go back to the panoramas and open the confluence panorama as if we did, uh, as, as we did with the, the main one, or we have a spec set up here to be able to cycle through our panoramas. So we can cycle through to the confluence, which is our next panorama. And here, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna add one little image here. 
I'll just add an image here as we did before. And we're just going to call this the mixing point. And let's add some text in there. And we'll bring the mixing point right on in here. And there we go. I also want to add a little title here, um, just like we did to the other one for the confluence. Uh, we'll just say, these are the sacred waters of the Grand Canyon. There we go. Now we have two options here. We can go back. We want to have our navigation as just showed about our flow map. We can go back to the granaries. So we can click here and make a simple panorama that takes us back to the granaries. And we'll just put that right in here and give a little hotspot back to it and we're all done. Or maybe we want to go one more path down the river. In this case, we simply change it to panorama, call this the narrows. And we're good to go. Now we can't just be done because we just made a link to the narrows. So let's go to the narrows, which is an actually interesting site because it's, it's a place where you see Piano Rock. And I was going to have an image there, but there's what Piano Rock looks like, which is kind of cool. And let's say we want to start this view when we get here. Well, we have spots up here that can do that. So we want to set the default view for the current panorama to this. So we do that. So that means when we jump into this panorama, we'll see this particular image first of this view. And now we want to be able to jump back. And instead of jumping back to the confluence, let's jump all the way back to the granaries. So we put that in here. And we jump back to the granaries. And we're good to go. Now, when we come back to the granaries, this is where we are going to start. Well, this isn't that appealing. We maybe want to look at this downriver view right here. So we can do the same thing here. We can set this as the default. But maybe we, we've started with a different panorama. We can also set this as the start panorama for the project. So we can change that depending. So we'll just make sure this one's set. Now, I told you about our little spot with the loo. What I'm going to add here, and this is a slightly more advanced um, element, but it is something that I just wanted to show you that's a, a possibility and, and, and you have the, the ability to do that, is we're going to add a URL, uh, which gives you access to a web page or any other kind of uh, um, uh, HTTPS. It has to be, that site has to be able to allow you to share it. But I'm going to add a URL of a gigapan, one of the gigapans that we have. So I'm just going to call this zoom in look. There we go. And I'm going to hit OK. So now let's say we're done with our, our panorama or our, our project. I can preview it right here. So I can click here and I can preview our project. And here it is. Um, we see the title and the, the opening text I put in up here. We see links down here to our other panoramas. If I wanted to, I can close those down. I can view the pics. Here are boats on the river. What's like on the river? Um, if I go a little slower, here is a picture of the granary bins that I put in there with some text in there. Here's our video of Dr. Simkin. We're sitting at about 600 feet above the level of the river. All works. I can look back down here. Here's the PDF that we put in. Um, as it, we still have to go through the, the loading um, of that particular file. And there we go. So here's our river guide that we put in there. We have the ability to zoom in as a regular PDF functions. Um, we have our loo, our necessities down here. And I'm going to skip the gigapan for just one second, and we're going to jump down river. So I can jump down river to the confluence. You can see that that's where we're going. Gives a little highlight. The confluence pops up. We can look around. I can look at the mixing point. Of course, we can jump back over here, and it shows we've already been there to the granaries. Or we can jump to the narrows. So I will jump to the narrows. There's the piano location that we set. 
And now we can jump back to the granaries. Now, the other part that I wanted to highlight was this spot I put in here. This is a, a, a little more advanced, but it allows us to load things like gigapans. Gigapans are very large as a the term giga image, but it gives us the ability to completely zoom in to different features. Um, this might not stream as quickly as it's happening, but it will zoom down to looking at different features. You have the full capability of moving around as well as uh, using the thumbnails on the bottom if they were created. And as I scroll over here, you could actually zoom right down in here to the loop. And so you can see that down there where that would be as it relates to a campsite if that's something you were to highlight. Or in fact, the, the tents that we stayed in. So Jeff, there's a couple of questions that are over in chat for you. Sure. Um, one yep. is, uh, what, is it, what is the recommended amount of details to add in a panoramic view? So like, sure. should there be limits or are there limits? So I let me uh, yes perfect. So one thing. So I, I one more thing to do if, if that's okay. Um, the this was where we finished and we did a preview. So I, I don't want you all to miss this section. Um, you saw some of the features up here. Uh, this is where you can see all your hotspots and jump around to them directly. But your 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 panorama isn't published at this point. You have to come back to your projects, your panorama or your, your panorama section, and here's your share button. When you click the share button. It tells you you're now making it public. You should own the rights, as Jess said about the, uh, the copyrights and that they're yours. And you confirm it, and it gives you a shared link. And this is an external link that now is can be shared and is it publicly viewable um, by everyone. Uh, and it's, it's that simple. So I'm going to stop sharing and then answer the questions. There we go. Um, so uh, what is the amount of text? That is completely dependent on you. We've seen over time that sometimes when you put a whole bunch of uh, information in the spherical, in the panorama, A, a student could get lost in where they've been, where they're going, what's what, um, but also it's covering up your character. So uh, you want to be sensitive about how you use that type of media. And, and um, there are ways that maybe you uh, combined images into one image that pops up. Or one of the questions that we heard yesterday in a, in a different um, workshop was, uh, how do you navigate a user through multiple um, images if you want them to progress? So an idea there is that you could have the same panorama since it's going to be already cached and you link from maybe the granaries to the granaries, but the second granaries has more images and the next one maybe has more images. And so you can take the user on a, a, um, a guided tour that way if you'd like to do that. Um, uh, so Jeff, yeah, any more? So the answer is completely up to you. You just don't want to overwhelm your user. Um, are there limits to how many panoramas you can upload? No. Okay. Not uh, yet. <laughs> and then um, uh, do you want me to address the one about where the tool can be accessed? Um, sure. <laughs> Um, so currently we are in beta testing with this tool. So we have just a, a, a clutch of people that are teachers that are working with this and a clutch of students that are working with it. Um, and so once we have all of our feedback in from those, those beta testers, we can make some subtle modifications. Um, and actually that does lead to um, something Sina is gonna share real quick. Let me do my quick screen share here. Um, so a little bit about summer professional development. Okay, so as you may recall from last week, the two teachers who shared their virtual tours, Sarah Bowman and John Dupuis, had both created them during our summer professional development. And many of you had asked if we would be offering that again this year. And ta-da, here it is. So we will have a workshop uh, July 19th through 22nd. So it's over four days, but it's about an hour and a half, maybe two hours each day uh, with some assignments kind of in between asynchronously. And if you do the workshop, you will get early access to this tool. So we, we haven't released it sort of in mass yet, 
Um, so we have a certain number of accounts that we're giving out at the moment. And so anyone who attends the workshop will get early access to the tool. And we'll cover all of the things that we've identified throughout our experience, our years of experience creating virtual tours about what is it that makes a virtual tour. We'll walk you through that process of um, storytelling, creating your flow map, all the tools and resources that you um, need and have access to, as well as curating your multimedia. As Jessica mentioned before, we talk about Creative Commons licensing and then uh, virtual tour builder. Mm -hmm. And so that is July 19th through 22nd. And it will be limited to a small group of participants. So if you're interested, we will be sending out a post event survey. And in that survey, you'll have an opportunity to reserve your spot and get on the mailing list to get future updates. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, if you want early access to the tool, you got to sign up for the PD this summer. <laughs> Um, so it is part of our slow rollout program um, to get this thing out into the hands of educators. Um, so let me take a moment and thank you, Jeff, for taking us on a, a, a demo tour of the virtual tour builder. Um, I am super excited about where we're going in the future with it. Um, and specifically regarding all of the cool storytelling and place-based education and research and also some of the cool tools that you can use to make your tours, which is my transition to Tom. It's a terrible, terrible transition to Tom, but there it is. So Tom, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Oh, and um, Tom, you were a little quiet earlier, so maybe speak just a little louder. Huh, nobody's ever told me that. Awesome. All right, give me one second and I will share my screen. Let's see if I got the right one. So are you seeing my slides or are you seeing my presentation? Can't hear you. I am seeing, the, okay. All right, so I have a lot to cover, so my apology. Pardon? Your presentation. The, the, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. I see what you meant. We see the slides on the side, yes. Ah, let me try sharing another screen. You should be able to go to, I think it's view and swap displays. I think that's where it is. Or we can do it this way too. How about that? Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna blow through this really quick. So my motivation, um, I'm really interested in the promises and perils of the Anthropocene. So I'm interested in building virtual field trips um, for those challenges, uh, climate change, population growth, resource depletion. Uh, that is the motivation for going back to school at this age. Um, I want to touch on place uh, real quick because place has been centered to this presentation. So a place can be uh, any size or scale, and it's any location that we give meaning to. And a place can be real, remote, virtual, or imaginary. Um, and places, when we talk about place-based uh, education, places populate a cultural landscape that's interwoven with a natural landscape. And that cultural landscape is the piece that makes something uh, a place-based experience um, that makes a virtual field trip place-based instead of something that doesn't tout the cultural element that is just a field trip. Um, so think of a meaningful place to you and why it's meaningful and how you feel when you think about that place. Uh, and that could be, these are good guiding questions to choose what you want to uh, feature in your VFT. 
Um, as far as place-based education in the, um, in the field, it means a certain thing. So field learning occurs in places and it's by its nature place-based. Um, but instead of focusing on global concepts, a place-based teaching technique lets the natural and cultural meanings of a place uh, dictate the curriculum. So if uh, we are going to go up to the south rim of the Grand Canyon, uh, you could teach your students uh, in the classroom about stratigraphy, geology, fossils, uh, biodiversity, all of that. But when you do a place-based uh, education experience, the place dictates what you teach. So you can pick elements of that place and let the place uh, lead you into what you want to share. Um, we make intellectual and emotional connections to places. And this is the formal definition of sense of place. We imbue places with meanings and we form attachments. And that sense of place is the set of all of these meanings and attachments held by either yourself or a group for any given place. Uh, so sense of place is a combo of uh, the meanings and attachments we form to a place. Um, virtual field trips are place-based and uh, an increased sense of place is a learning outcome of place-based experiences. So an increased sense of place has cognitive, effective, and behavioral components. So by featuring a place, the natural and cultural landscape, you can create a VFT uh, that deals with uh, cognitive gains, effective behavior, or any combination of them. And there are specific uh, tools and validated instruments that can measure uh, pre to post changes or gains in sense of place. Um, my PhD advisor, uh, Steve Simkin, uh, is uh, well versed in this. And these are, um, there's a, a kind of a roadmap of how to create a place based educational experience. And it's to focus on the natural attributes of the place. Uh, to meaningfully integrate the culture to attributes, um, teach with authentic experiences, um, promote environmentally and cultural sustainable practices, and then encourage and guide students to form their own intellectual and emotional connections. And how, how do we do that? Um, you know, so we can do that in person or we can do it virtually. Um, but uh, the biggest thing I would point out is this one right here. Model strong place attachment for your students. Your passion, your identity, your attachment to a place comes through to the students and, and your excitement becomes infectious. So how did we get here? Well, uh, Chris Mead uh, led a group in ETX, our research group, and he found that the VFTs led to statistically significant content knowledge gains uh, for high school and undergraduate settings. And my master's thesis looked at in-person virtual field trips and the virtual field trip students um, scored higher on uh, pre to post evaluation than the in-person. Uh, so armed with this evidence-based research, we asked the question, can students and teachers be given the tools to produce VFTs uh, using our principles? Uh, keep in mind that when Jeff produces a VFT for ETX, uh, he leads a team and there's significant time uh, and resources. Uh, so we have this idea of, can we democratize this process so we can get more quality content into the field? Um, so we've launched uh, studies to, to identify just that. Can we teach teachers and students to build these? So we've done this in a number of settings, summer camps, semester long courses, professional development, but learners work in small groups and they get uh, instruction and technical advice. They each uh, choose a locally relevant science or sustainability topic, and then they go and capture the content. And uh, much like Rita had that uh, video earlier, we bring in guest experts uh, in all of the components. When I think about virtual field trips in terms of my research, I break them down into um, storyboarding and research as an element, content acquisition as another element, design and production as another element, and then finally testing and implementation. There are a number of ways to break that up, um, but those are some of the ways that I look at them. 
And these are just a sampling of some of the uh, student and teacher produced VFTs this uh, endeavor has produced. Um, so we've got some quality content that is being then developed by teachers and students and then being used in other classes as a teaching tool. Um, so this is a very exciting development. Uh, and the results quickly of this were students and teachers can definitely be taught and um, student produced VFTs can be used as a learning tool for other students. Uh, students reported strong learning gains and the VFTs are viewed positively. And more importantly, um, teachers indicated that a course where their students created their own VFTs would be educationally valuable. And that's the crux of my research and what I'm most interested in. Um, it is one thing to consume a VFT. Um, I'm studying the sense of place gains for students that consume a VFT. But my real interest is if we can teach teachers to be comfortable with this technology, let them build them so they assign the production of a VFT to students then I think the sense of place gains, it makes sense to me, will be significantly greater than simply consuming one. Um, so our, our goal is to both teach you how to do this, but to have you assign this over a period of time uh, and let the students go and build these uh, under your uh, guidance. So let's just talk, um, we use the term IVFT. Um, that's uh, been part of my research. It's what uh, Jeff sold you and it's married with an intelligent tutoring system. But their elements are high resolution 360 photos. They anchor the virtual field trips as Jeff showed you. And then we use overlays that can have gigapixel or traditional photos and 2D or 360 video. You can have cartography, 3D objects and text. So those are some of the elements. Um, and what we've used is smartphones uh, with the students for photos and videos. Uh, some have bridge mirrorless or DSLR cameras that they use. Um, we recommend a smartphone microphone uh, for audio. Uh, sometimes you might need a lighting equipment, which can be as simple as the flashlight on the back of your smartphone. Uh, recommend uh, tripods and then computer hardware and software, uh, mostly for photo and video editing. And I just want to jump into some of the 360 cameras. Um, you can spend as little or as much as you want. And I'm going to go through this quickly and turn my thing, my uh, PowerPoint off because I have a lot of these cameras that I'd like to show you. Uh, I'll just hold them up to my uh, camera. So Insta360 offers things from $15,000 down to $200. Uh, Rico has the Theta and uh, the two versions of that. Uh, we have used both of these in uh, VFT classes at ASU. Uh, Garmin offers uh, something. Um, and uh, because it's Garmin and you think of GPS, it has all GPS sensors built into it. So your videos can uh, track your elevation, your speed, your temperature, uh, your direction, and things like that. Uh, GoPro has a 360 camera. And then Views uh, has uh, two different cameras. So uh, a quick overview, um, all of the cameras that I just showed you capture both photos and videos. And they can be operated either directly from the camera or many of them are operated via smartphone. Um, so the advantage of a smartphone, uh, you would link it uh, via wireless to the camera. There's a little app on your smartphone and it lets you be out of the way. Um, uh, I spend most of my time trying to hide from my own 360 camera, so I'm not in the photo. Um, so uh, being able to have an iPad or a phone uh, to take that picture and be away from the camera is uh, really helpful. And a lot of these cameras include editing software for both your smartphone and computer. Um, and a couple of tips. Uh, it's always helpful to use a tripod uh, if you can. Uh, remember, 360 camera captures everything. There's no place to hide. And also, uh, most cameras, and I'll show you, have two lenses. And uh, I'm going to give you a tip about how to place those lenses. Um, and then uh, there's a number of sites you can just uh, search for 360 photos where you can uh, upload uh, your 360 photos and view them uh, as a 360 image. The last thing I want to touch on before I show you some of these cameras is that you can use your smartphone for the entire production process. 
in addition to taking photos and videos. Uh, there are free apps or very inexpensive apps that will turn your cell phone into a 360 camera. Um, and they include Google Street View. Um, I've listed a bunch of them here. Uh, but if you through search 360 photos in either the App Store or the Play Store, uh, you'll find these. And you can shoot those handheld or with a tripod. Um, some will shoot spherical. So uh, uh, you're inside of a ball, think of that. Others will shoot cylinders. So you're inside of a cylinder. Um, and there's a, a number of inexpensive heads and I'm gonna show you one uh, that will work with your phone uh, and actually spin it around and take those photos for you. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and I just want to bring up I just want to show you uh, a couple of these cameras. So, you know, on the very high end, you have something like this, which has six lenses, and this can shoot 360 photos and videos in both 2D or 3D, um, deliverable to a screen, a phone, or a headset. And then, uh, on the other end, you can have something like the, the Theta, which has two lenses. And what I was telling you about, if you, there's gonna be a stitch line between these two lenses, if you want to use a 360 camera, you wanna make sure that your subject is centered on one of these because your stitch line, if you did this this way, you'd stitch right in the middle of my face and my nose is big enough and it would distort my nose and you wouldn't like that. So you always wanna face uh, the lenses to your most important thing in your scene. And let uh, me interrupt. Let me interrupt you there. Um, that was the Theta Five, yeah. That was the Z One, actually. That's the Z One. Yeah. Um, so the Theta Five is discontinued. They have they replaced it with this Theta SC Two. Ah. Um, so we have ordered uh, fifteen of these that are things available for on loan. So I want to let you all know that that is a possibility. We are currently working on our checkout system for these and what that's going to look like. Um, so just be aware that we have these. We have tripods with them, and we also have clickers so that if you want to use something like this with your students, they don't have to use a cell phone. Uh, here's another example. This is a small 360 camera, but it opens up in case you want to do 180 degree work. So you could do 3D in 180 degrees photos and videos. Um, so, you know, you can immerse yourself as much as you want in this technology. If you really want to capture three-dimensional sound, you can get a little uh, mic like this that captures sound in all directions so that when you spin in a video, the audio field matches what you're seeing. Um, and what else do I have to show you? Um, I had mentioned this is a little motorized, it takes two batteries. There's an app for my phone. You can put your phone in like this. You can put this on a tripod and it would literally spin the phone, take all the pictures for you and build you a 360 photo. You can also buy an app for your phone. And if you buy an app that does cylinders, you are def just doing this and you're taking the picture where it tells you to. And if you do something that's spherical, in addition to going around, you're gonna go up and down and that will create a spherical image for you. One of the things that we, um, we recommend, and I think Jess said that she's purchasing something, but a simple, inexpensive, lightweight VR tripod. The camera can go on here, Let's see this. And now there's no part of the tripod obstructing the camera's view. So these are meant for 360 cameras and very inexpensive for between five and $10. You can get yourself a little cell phone mount that would go on that. And now instead of hand holding for photos or videos, your phone can go on there. And then the last piece of the inexpensive equipment I want to share with you is people will tolerate semi bad video but they typically do not tolerate bad audio. So, you know, for 40 or $50, you can get what a, a smartphone mic and they're made for Android or iOS if you have a headphone jack or if you have a lightning. But these basically 
go onto your camera like that. And now when you're filming, you have a little directional mic and the audio is infinitely better than what you would collect with your just uh, built-in microphones. So that is a very quick overview of kind of what place is, sense of place, and some of the cameras that are available or your smartphone alone. Um, and I think um, Jess and Cena would love me to say, we go into incredible detail in the summer professional development series um, and actually teach you um, how to use these things. So uh, thank you for your time. And Jess, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both. I, I know what we were asking of you was a whirlwind tour <laughs> in a very short period of time. Um, but hopefully everyone found that at least the whirlwind tour was, was incredibly helpful in, in getting you to kind of start to imagine what kind of stories you might be able to tell for your students. Um, and if you're interested um, signing up for the, the summer professional development. So Tom, Jeff, you guys are invaluable to this process. So you know we're gonna be calling on you again to help us out this summer. So y'all will be able to see them again and get a little bit deeper. Um, just a quick plug, if you are not already a member of the network, there are at least uh, nine of you. I know that. If you're not already a member of the network, I highly recommend you join. Um, everything that we talk about is completely free because we are NASA funded. So just go to infiniscope.org, make your request and stay up to date on all of our new content releases, um, upcoming training opportunities and social events. Um, also don't forget to connect with us via social media. So we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Pinterest. Uh, we have a couple of different hive spaces. We also have a hive space in Slack that that's our community space. And of course you can reach out to Sina and I at any time. And as Sina had mentioned, there will be a follow-up survey. So we are getting the, um, attendee or the right yeah, attendee list at the conclusion of this. So you'll be receiving an email from Chris Mead. So he works here in the ETX Center. It will have the survey for both of these sessions. Um, so there are some questions in there for you. And if you want us to save your spot, make sure that you note that. If you're just interested in hearing about it when we're ready, note that also. Um, other than that, we have about seven minutes left. So if there are any outstanding questions you have for us, by outstanding, I mean the best questions. Let's see. Uh, let's see, questions. So there was a question about what is the mic? And Tom said it is the Rode video mic, R-O-D-E, and he is 100% correct. Audio, people just never forgive bad audio. We have experienced that time and time and time again. <clears throat> um, will the recordings be available? I think that is a Kelly question. Yes, they will be available and hopefully sooner than later. Um, we will be sharing that link out to you all and it'll also be available on our website at sustainabilityfestival.asu.edu. Awesome, thank you so much, Kelly. Any other questions. Katrina is spellbound by all of the amazing creations. Yeah, I'm super excited to see what people create, to be honest. Everyone, you're a, it's a maker in the virtual world. Think of it that way. It's a totally different type of maker movement. I hope it's not lost on anyone that we teach how to build virtual field trips virtually. Virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Tom, so clever. <laughs> All right. Um, and then there's another question in the chat for you, Kelly. When is the sustainability, sustainability festival held this year? The Sustainability Solutions Festival this year, this is our last event at the 2021 Sustainability Solutions Festival. However, we do have teacher resources available through Bear Central News. We create a fun book every year that talks about environmental issues and sustainability issues at a third grade level um, with fun activities. We also, um, we're planning next year and next year we're, you know, we're tentatively a hybrid model for next year going in person and some online. And we're planning to host that during February of 2022. Um, I know we'll have some in-person stuff in the works with Arizona Science Center and um, some awesome teacher opportunities with them as well. Awesome. 
and you know, in celebration, or I guess in recognition of this is the final part of the event. There we go. Um, let's see, Bridget, great question. When we're out of testing phase, will this be available for teachers to use through a membership slash fee? So for the next four and a half years, it is definitely 100% free with an R, no fee with EE. I guess they both have EE. Um, at the conclusion of that, we're not sure. We continue to seek additional grant funding to make sure that these kind of tools will be made available to you for free. Um, and if this one is not, then there are definitely pieces and parts that maybe it'll be more of a freemium model as opposed to a free model. But definitely for the next four and a half years. But honestly, anything that you publish is, I mean, it's published. It's, it's out there in, in the world. See, will the summer PD be available for other teachers? Yes, Chandra. We will um, make that openly available, but we are limiting the number of seats available. I don't know how many seats we're limiting to yet. That will be a conversation with Jeffrey as we continue to move forward. He's the keeper of all of my little number of little licenses. All right, any other final questions in our last few minutes together? Oh good, I'm glad you found it informative. Well, we appreciate all of you being here and meeting all of our new, new people. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure sharing with you all of the cool things that are coming uh, to the Infiniscope Network. And again, a huge thank you to our presenters, Jeff and Tom and Sina. Um, do this stuff without you. Well, thank you all. We will be seeing you in the hive space. Thank you all. I can't wait to see what you think.